All right, I'm here today with Dr. Deb to learn more about the dissection classes that she is offering coming up this March and November in Canada. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you guys do in a, in a dissection. Is it a class or a clinic? Uh, well, it's an intensive. Intensive, it's okay. A it's a five-day intense experience. There's a lot to learn. That You know, if you're in veterinary school or if you're trying to be a veterinary assistant or a veterinary nurse, uh, you're going to be given an anatomy class that will last a term, which would be normally around six weeks. And you're going to have lots of opportunities. Usually they have the labs open at night uh, for the entire six weeks, which means you can go in there at your own convenience in addition to your regular laboratory sessions that are led by the teaching assistant and the lectures that are given by the professor. Well, we haven't got anything like that amount of time. Neither could we offer the class in that manner because at a veterinary school, they will have multiple carcasses and they're all pickled, which destroys the tissue feel. Because when they put, if they pickle them in formalin, or which is very typical, or salt, uh, no matter how they do that, it makes the tissue real hard. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you, you have to do something because no carcass is going to last six weeks. <laughs> Even if you had a refrigerated room, which nobody likes because they're freezing to death in there. So we do it in cooler seasons mm -hmm. and for only a week and that the carcass will last that long especially if i take it apart in the right way uh, in other words if you leave the guts in there it's going to heat up mm -hmm. so the very usually if i have a specimen that has not been degutted before class which they sometimes are uh, but these aren't so you get your opportunity to learn how long the horse's digestive tube is on the first day, because mm -hmm. it's me that winds up degutting the, the specimen. But that's to the benefit of the of whoever is there because they're going to get to see it. So the horse has a, a remarkably long intestinal tube because its grass is a really hard thing to digest. And it takes a long time for the stuff to move through the system. And it has to and that and it, so the system is a long tube so that uh, there is lots of opportunity for the gut bacteria and the body cells to interact with what's in the lumen, what's in the inside of the tube. <laughs> so we do that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, which is implied in what I've already said, is we use a whole carcass. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the the the, the people most commonly in North America who have will have att already attended some kind of an anatomy class uh, outside of college will be farriers. Mm -hmm. Many farriers are given the opportunity while they're in farrier school or wherever they learn how to do farrier, or they will go to a convention and be offered opportunities to see the distal part of the legs taken apart. Mm -hmm. by a dissectionist who really knows what they're doing, uh, which is great. But let me tell you a, a sad, sad story, but it's a true story. And we've and I told this story in a recent Eclectic Horseman article. Uh, I was at a clinic and there was a very eager woman who had been in farrier practice, had been shoeing horses for, I don't know, 10 years or better, and she did go to farrier school and she, you know, she's as qualified as anybody else. And she got her certified farrier thing from the certificate from the American farriers, uh, from the, uh, the AF, the, uh, uh, American farriers association, the AFA. Um, and so we're examining a horse and she asked me some kind of a question about the tendons. And I said, well, okay, the reason that happens is because 
it isn't just a tendon. She said, what do you mean? And I said, there's no such thing as just a tendon. There are no things that are merely tendons. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, what, what's the, what is the deep flexor tendon connected to? She says, well, it's connected to the ankle. And I said, yeah, but I mean above. What do you mean above? She says. She had no idea that it is a tendon is the extension of the continuation of a muscle. So it's not the DDF. It's not the deep digital flexor, the DDFT. It is the tendon of the deep digital flexor muscle. Okay, and I explained that to her and she says, well, so where's the muscle? And I said, it's on the back of the forearm. It's above the knee. She said, what? In other words, her mind, the picture she carries in her mind of a horse's leg is a complete blank from the knee up. This is why I do not offer that class. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wonderful they've had some experience looking at something that's, that's real, a real animal body part, but you cannot understand how the body works unless you see the entire limb which means from the hoof all the way up to the top of the shoulder. And you still can't understand it then because somehow the shoulder has to be connected to the body. What is it you're sitting on when you ride your horse? So most of the people who attend these classes are of two kinds of my classes. Mm -hmm. One kind is people who want to uh, do body work of some form mm -hmm. or mu muscle massage or trigger point or acupressure or whatever modality they have, but they're not just going to be working on the lower parts of the legs. Mm -hmm. They, they want to know about the whole body. And the other type of person who signs up is the committed horse owner. Who, who wants to know all they can and are, is just in love with horses as we all are. We're all addicts, as I've of, often said, <laughs> <laughs> and who shows up because this is just too neat. Mm -hmm. This is just too wonderful. And it is. So when they call in and they say, is it going to stink? My answer to that is God does not make junk. And I would, and I don't teach junkie class. I don't abuse students. I would never make anybody hang in there and have to endure the, this odor of rot mm -hmm. for a week. And so, so we get them fresh. They're either fresh frozen and then thawed or else the animal is killed the night before the class. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, we don't ever just kill a horse in order that we can cut one up because mm -hmm. it's just surplus. No, I get donations which are committed ahead of time for either horses that are there at the end of their life, a long life, so we have an old specimen, or they have something uh, like uh, laminitis, which ha and their vet has, and the owner have agreed that it's time for the horse to go. And it's at some point, uh, is to a degree flexible. Exactly what day he gets killed on. Mm -hmm. So we get. I try to get smaller horses. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because a horse is a three dimensional object, and before I can show anybody any anatomy, I have to skin the thing. Uh, so it takes a lot. I got to tell quite a few good stories. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the bigger yeah. the animal is, the more time that's going to take. Yeah. Not, not that it's that, not that that itself is, you know, there are most of the attendees are, have never seen anything like this. And so they're fascinated from the first, I whip out my knife, they're ready to go, man. They're leaning over my shoulder, watch it. Mm -hmm. and, and of course there is something to see. The, the, the fascia that holds the skin in place is the target of certain types of, of massage techniques. Yeah. The, sub, the subcutaneous fascia, and, which is what 
uh, the hypodermis is where you use a hypodermic needle. Okay. And it's the it's the boundary line between the skin or the hide and what everything that lies beneath. And even that is worth looking at. I mean, there, there isn't anything that isn't interesting. Now, the course, I say that, but if you tried to look at every detail, it, you'd, it would take longer than, a, than a, a college term. You, you can spend a lifetime doing this. So I have had to select, or you might say this is a highlights course because you only, we only have a week. So what we primarily cover, and that's my bias because I this is what I enjoy the most is biomechanics. And that mostly involves the musculoskeletal system. So the muscles with their tendons, <laughs> because almost all muscles have at least one tendon, which is the extension of that muscle, and the ligaments, which are a different type of connective tissue that whose function is to, to hook the bones together, to bind the bones together. But although it also has other functions sometimes, such as uh, annular ligaments that that hold things in place. Okay, so we study muscles, tendons, ligaments, and bones, of course, and everything to do with bones, including the periosteum and the intermuscular septa. And of course, we do also look, to, I have them take a, a hoof completely apart. And we do that in by several methods so that we see different aspects of what's inside the hoof capsule, what navicular disease is, because of course, all of these things have implications uh, in terms of the soundness or the athletic ability of the horse. So uh, there's all kinds of questions that come up. Every This is related to everything. It's related to horsemanship as well and to riding technique and what is and is not sustainable in terms of training practices. Because now they're gonna see how the horse arches its neck. What we talk, I talk all the time about what collection is and how important that is to understand. If you ride, I don't care how you ride, you still have to understand collection because there is no healthy horse that moves so much as two, two steps without rounding up his back. And that is the lowest degree of collection. It, if you're doing enduro, you, you, your horse isn't gonna look like a Grand Prix dressage horse, <laughs> it, but he's still collected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and many people think, well, no, he's not. Well, yes, he is. Unless, unless here is a, a horse that is not gonna make it. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. not gonna last, that is not gonna you know, he's not going to pay back all that trouble and time you spent to train him mm -hmm. because it's not sustainable. So you got your saddle seat horse and sometimes your endurance horse that that operate what we say upside down. In other words, with a stiff hollow back. Well, how does that work? What what does it result in? Sometimes it results in kissing spines. We hear a lot about that lately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, now they get to see them. They're, wow. They're right yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cool. By the, yeah. By the time we get the, the dissection down to a fairly deep level, uh, it essentially weakens uh, the connections. And you can then, because it's a horse is a big animal, so it's hard to manipulate the skeleton uh, if it's a very, if it's stuck to the table because of okay. the weight of the flesh. But once you have taken off a lot of that, then it becomes possible for a couple of people to grab onto the horse and and move, and you can actually see how the spine works. It's the only chance you'll ever have to do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to, I always tell people to go to a museum and to support museums with their tax dollars and with their contributions when they come through the door. Why? That is the only place where you can see a mounted horse skeleton. 
Mm -hmm. It is also the only place where you're probably going to be able to see a boxed specimen, meaning the horse bones not articulated, but just in a box. Mm -hmm. that, that'll happen at the discovery center or the discovery room. Okay, well and good. But when they're in a box, they're not hooked together. And when they're mounted, they're on an armature, which is not movable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, when are you going to ever see the skeleton function as it actually functions in life? Well, this is where you do that. This is where you do that. Yeah. And that's also true for the limbs. The, we do several manipulations of the limbs, including understanding the check stay and reciprocating apparatus in the front leg and the reciprocating apparatus in the hind leg, which is in horses very, very specialized. An amazing system that links all these muscles together and that saves the horse having to actually flex its the muscles in its limbs when it moves. So the horse can store energy in some of these elastic structures that are built in its limbs, which saves it a lot in terms of survivability as a wild animal, but it also makes it a beautiful animal. I mean, a horse is a lot more attractive, at least to my eye, and I bet to yours, uh, when it moves than a cow. Mm -hmm. Right. Why? Because when you watch a cow trot or gallop, it's it's much more of a of a uh, stiff and inelastic, and why? Because cows don't have those systems. Ah. Or if they have them at all, they have them much less developed. Mm -hmm. So, but a horse exists and survives by its ability to run away and to sustain the running over a long enough period that it wears the carnivore out. That the cat or the wolf pack that's chasing it is just simply can't make it uh can't continue to pursue because they're going to run out of air as much as the horse is going to run out of air but the horse has longer legs and a more elastic system mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's what he counts on to you know make it a winner unless he's a very sick or old animal and in which case that's the function of the predator is to clean those out of the herd Mm -hmm. so but we get to see we get to see this live you get to touch it you get to manipulate it if you're doing therapeutic work the tissue quality is exactly the same as if you had a relaxed uh, live horse and uh, that that will not change until it absolutely rots and that's long after the class is over mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we also never waste anything so the hoofs come off of there and go into and i teach the the sponsor or whoever's going to receive the skeleton uh if it's mine i have a collection of them from years of doing this but uh these classes are sponsored by uh the equinology branch the canadian branch of the equinology company mm -hmm. and uh who either the venue sponsor or else perhaps the organizer who is from the company will will take the skeleton and either macerate it herself or arrange to have someone else do it uh this we i typically teach them to do this by bucket maceration or barrel maceration uh although there are other ways as well um but in some manner we will recover the skeleton from this whatever animal we dissect so that after that we have a teaching specimen mm -hmm. we have a, a box specimen yeah and yes which can go into somebody's truck who is out there educating clients so uh, if you have any idea what a horse skeleton costs to buy i mean uh, my good friend jay villa moret owns an outfit called Skulls Unlimited in Oklahoma City. If you're ever in Oklahoma City, be sure to go to the Osteology Museum, which is, Jay is a most generous man. He uh, took beautiful, his best stuff, and paid to have an expert crew of 
people who know how to mount skeletons and they, they are beautiful. The mounts are beautiful. And he put them all in a museum. He built the building and you can come and visit it. Hmm, cool. Wow. Now, it's extremely cool. Jay has a license from the state of Oklahoma to collect all of the, the zoo animals that die. So there's a rhino, there's an and there's a small Indian elephant in there. There is a giraffe. There's all kinds of skeletons. And that's another thing that's with my classes. Uh, it's great to study the horse, but you really need to broaden out in how are you going to appreciate what kind of an animal this is if you don't contrast it with other kinds of animals? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How special is a horse? Well, you have no idea until you look at a cow. Yeah, yeah. At least that, or a dog. Yeah, and you said you also, you also do some dog classes as well? Uh, yes, we're going to do these. Uh, the dog class follows immediately on the end of the, the horse class. Okay. So I'm going to be teaching horse March 1 to 5. Okay. Uh, somewhere outside Edmonton, Alberta. And the dog class will follow uh, right after that on the 8th through the 12th. This uh, double feature will be repeated in November from the 2nd to the 6th, somewhere uh, near Guelph, Ontario. Okay. Okay. I think they're going to try to do this at the at one of the campuses of Guelph, if, if I'm correct. Uh, and then a dog class to follow that. The dog is class is obviously different than the horse class in that we have a major concern in the horse class because what you do with horses is you ride them mainly. I mean, mm -hmm. you might drive them, but and you might plow with them, but the main use we find is under saddle. So it is very important to talk about collection and straightness and and uh, hoof breakover and. Uh, you know how to how to uh, supple a horse. All of that is directly goes back to the anatomy. So of course it gets talked about, but you don't sit on dogs. So the dog class, I'm taking my opportunity to teach some comparative anatomy, because you can learn so much. See, dogs still have fingers. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. still have toes, separate five toes, and four in the back and five in the front, usually, mm -hmm. and yes, and they have little muscles. There are little muscles in your palm that allow you to do this, what I'm doing, uh, that, that you know, like a Spock, live long and prosper. Mm -hmm. okay, there are muscles called lumbricals and interossei that allow you to make the, the scissoring motion of your fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if you're a horse, you have only one finger and it's that one mm -hmm. that is an actual functional digit. Okay. Well, it's hard to make a V with one finger. <laughs> but, but <laughs> so where did the suspensory apparatus come from? It is the modified remnant of the interosseous muscles, mm -hmm. which are several of them in the palm of the dog and in the palm of the person. That's how you use comparative anatomy mm -hmm. because doing the dog will greatly help you understand why the horse is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, most of the people who sign up for dog are people who want to do body work on dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, good enough. Uh, but, uh, I would love it if I got some horse people to also take the dog because that's, it's like chapter two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you've already had, I mean, there's quite a few people in North America that have already had a dissection class from me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they want to do something a little bit new or add to their knowledge, they could sign up for the dog thing. And, you know, I think we're going to do this, not just this year. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, you know, Maybe they'll come back the next time and do the dog thing, but I'm I'm kind of looking forward to dog because I I don't often get a chance to teach that and it is relevant to horse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So amazingly enough, all all, cool. all us animals got backbones. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll make sure and put the link to where folks can sign up. I'll find that information and put it 
yes. down below so they can get more more yeah. details she, uh. she they'll need the link too because it's it's a strange email address with a lot of vowels in it and you can easily get mixed up. Okay. Okay. I'll be sure and link it. In I'll be de novo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you've been teaching this class uh, or dissection classes for a really long time. Yeah. Do you have any stories that you want to share about, um, you know, folks who had big light bulb moments or, or anything oh, that well. comes to mind? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I've been I've been teaching this since 1992, and I invented it. I mean, I will take uh, to my knowledge, there was no one else on Earth to that point who had ever thought that it might be useful, or it might even be not wrong, to teach carcass an actual carcass class to what are called lay people. In other mm -hmm. words, people that are not in veterinary school. Uh, kind of the inspiration for that was my boss and mentor at Equus Magazine, who was Dr. Matthew McKay Smith. And Matthew founded that magazine partly with the overall idea that he was going to teach basic biology to horse owners, mm -hmm. just basic stuff. So early numbers of that magazine concerned themselves with what is the circulation? How, what's the circulatory? So what does it do? Mm -hmm. What kind of cells are in the immune system? Uh, and But also, he taught them to give their own intramuscular injections, which got him vilified by the veterinary community of the time. This would be mm -hmm. back in the 19, early 1980s. Uh, I think 79 or 80 was their first number. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely legal to give your own IMs. It is not legal to give an I, uh, IV injection uh, at least to anybody else's horse for money. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is the purview of the veterinarian. Matthew knew that. I know that. Mm -hmm. We all know that. But there is nothing on earth to prevent you from giving your own uh, vaccinations, which are IMs, mm -hmm. you, you shoot it into the muscle, or uh, stuff like uh, liquid glucosamine for horses that have you know, starting on arthritis. That's often very beneficial, but you do you do need to know how to give an injection safely. And mm -hmm. he taught them this in the pages of the magazine, which got him a raft of trouble from other vets. Why? Because it's taking their income. His mm -hmm. reply to this was, you are trained to do better stuff. You could be spending your time on colics, on laminitis, on surgeries of all kinds that for which you are trained, and you can give up this $20 extra. Mm -hmm. it, it Because you're going to get it back 100 times over from owners who will then trust you better and re realize that you're not just in this to take the, you know, the small money. And that argument ultimately prevailed. Mm -hmm. So I watched this controversy. They, they uh, began working with me in 1986. And by that point it had kind of cooled the, you know, off some, and, but I knew all about it. And I thought, you know, what can I do? So there came an opportunity. I was boarding my horse at this place in Healdsburg, California by that point, and the neighbor's small pony died, and I the light bulb went on in my head, and I said, okay, and I went out and I bought a small freezer, and I borrowed, I big borrowed and stole as some, the guy next door had a forklift, and we picked him up, and I got the owner's permission to take him, because they got to pay to dispose of them. So yeah. if it's yeah. an old, some old pony from out back that they haven't even looked at in years, they generally don't care. And they're happy to make a donation if it's going to make somebody, uh, it's going to contribute to the education of people. So I collected him and I got him in the freezer. And the, the, the freezer is a wonderful thing because it allows you to schedule a class at your convenience. Mm -hmm. And then it, it only then becomes uh, a matter of experience to put a good enough truss on the thing that you dropped in the freezer 
so that you can pull it back out again when it comes time. Yeah, yeah. That's a real pain in the butt. I can imagine the learning curve on that one. Uh, yeah. You do need to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we had, I began these classes and that's how they began. So, uh, and they have been well appreciated. So I'm extremely pleased to be working for this Canadian outfit because uh, they are very professional and well-prepared. And so I'm sure that, in fact, I've taught at one of these places before because Guelph University had me as a guest lecturer years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I know they're gonna have a comfortable experience. You know, 10 o'clock is holy, holy coffee break time. And so what they get when they enroll is you get 50% of the time is spent in the classroom learning what, why the thing exists, how it works, and what we're going to be doing in the afternoon, which is then when we do our dissection. So that it's a long day. We start at 9 a.m. You get two lectures every morning, one and with a break in between so we can have the holy, holy coffee break. Um, and then you get the whole afternoon. So we have a working lunch where I either continue to answer questions while I'm munching my sandwich or else question and answer period. And then we go out to the lab or wherever the lab is and do wet lab or the actual carcass work until uh, they kick us out. Tip typically we'll knock off about 6 p.m. Uh, I do like to allow people a chance to rest and to kind of absorb what they've learned or else we all go out to dinner somewhere and continue the discussion there. <laughs> it's yeah. like nonstop for five days. So this is a, an intensive bit of work for myself as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how the class is structured. You get more than your money's worth. Mm -hmm. So the, the prices for these classes are exactly the same as what an enrolled student at a university would pay for an equivalent course. They are no, you're not being charged differently than an enrolled student, mm -hmm. okay? I got a, an amusing letter one time from this guy in France who is, they, they have a big training schools there for that teach theory, that teach how this is supposed to work, what collection is supposed to be. And he read my, my earlier book on confirmation, because this is years ago, and he, he just loves it. But it became evident during our conversation that he completely did not read it. <laughs> he still thinks that the way to get a horse to round up is to develop the muscles of its back. Okay, that's exactly the opposite of the truth. And, and it's a good story to illustrate the truism that adult learners only hear what they are already expecting to hear. So when I tell them something different and I, I'm telling them that whatever they heard in their French training school or wherever they got their certification is wrong, they don't hear it. Mm -hmm. And I have to repeat it over and over and over again until the message gets through. And then they go, you can't mean that. <laughs> or is that what you mean? And it's like, suddenly they begin to realize that what I've actually said, not what they heard, but what I actually said. And then, then they finally do hear what I actually said. So you're gonna learn how that, to train a horse by going to anatomy class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the only way to learn it, actually. Yeah. So, so I'd be please, I would be overjoyed if I got more trainers. Yeah. To sign yeah. up for that class because they they really need this. Yeah. But more farriers. I love having farriers because we have a terrible problem in North America with misdirected farrier education, mm -hmm. so that those guys are so subject they're so likely to be victimized by the next hot fad mm -hmm. okay why because they have no paradigm mm -hmm. it's one of the very few medically related professions that has no paradigm at all it has no set of governing 
ideas that allow predictions, accurate predictions to be made. Hmm. It's all what my daddy told me or what I learned in farrier school or what this other authority taught me. That's medieval. Mm -hmm. And but I would be happy to show a farrier how it how things actually work, like the girl I was speaking of before, who didn't realize that the tendons connect to anything uh, going up. Yeah. You, they yeah. connect to the things going down. <laughs> going down. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you've got to have the whole picture. And so, and I also am very pleased when I get um, people who are thinking of a career as veterinarians, but haven't really decided but own horses and, and enjoy them and want to learn how to train, but also have this sort of more uh, medical interest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great because some of what they're going to learn in even in vet school is also, if not wrong, it's, uh, you might say the emphasis is on the wrong syllable. Mm -hmm. The hack set is on the wrong syllable. <laughs> and that's particularly true with the reciprocating apparatus of the hindquarter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always taught, if it's taught at all, uh, it's taught from the stifle down. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, that's not where it starts. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's it starts in the lower back, and there is an upper and a lower subsystem to that system, which makes it work. And that that's also related to collection. The, the ultimate in co collection would be like to see a horse doing a levade. Mm-hmm where they, they squat down and back and round their back and arch their neck and go up in the air, okay? Well, how how do they squat? Mm -hmm. You ever see a horse squat? You ever ride a horse up on a trail ride yeah. and you're talking to your girlfriend and not looking what you're doing and the damn horse walks up under a log? Okay, you better be careful how you get out of there because they don't, or uh, tragic, situation is where they've loaded a horse in a trailer and they don't know to put the butt bar across immediately mm -hmm. they just put the the chain mm -hmm. it's too high and the, and a stupid horse backs out under the chain and it destroys his back doing that yeah because why do they do that because they don't know how to squat mm -hmm. it's not natural to horses to squat it is natural though if they round their back mm-hmm Okay, well, how is how does that work? Well, that's that linkage between the stifle and the lower back, which is the upper subsystem in the hind lean reciprocating apparatus. So you come to class, you learn about that. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, oh, it's very cool because it's going awesome. to make you able to ride up, to have all your horses uh, far more comfortable. Now, if you're an endurance rider and you want your horse to last, you're going to have to learn this because you cannot ride a horse strung out for a hundred miles and not hurt him. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't care if you pass the vet inspection, you, the long-term consequences are going to shorten his career, competitive career. You're mm -hmm. going to pay if you try to do stuff that's not sustainable. And what is not sustainable is what goes against the grain of their natural biomechanical system of the, what is how a horse is supposed to move. If you're doing saddle seat and you, uh, or something that re uh, asks the horse to rack, mm -hmm. okay, I don't have any objection to gated riding. And I've owned many a gated horse myself and enjoyed them, but my horses gate round. Mm -hmm. And they and they're beautiful when they do this. My friend Eyjolfur Isorfsen, who is called the Toltmeister of Iceland, was a champion primarily unusually because the Icelandic horses uh, do essentially uh, the five gates that an American saddlebred horse does. They have a, a the Tolt gate is very similar to the rack. Mm -hmm. And so they know how to do that. And they also have the equivalent, they call it the slow tolt. And that's equivalent to uh, at least some forms of what is called slow gate uh, with American horses. Usually the champion is the guy with the flashy rack, the horse that goes really fast. And But your first championships were large, not, not that he 
didn't rack his horse, but they were he was widely appreciated for the beauty of mm. his slow gait work mm -hmm. and the correctness of it. And that's exactly what I'm that's how I would teach somebody to ride to ride a gated horse as well. Yeah. 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 So because cool. it is beautiful when it's done right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I'm super excited to get the word out about this really uh, incredible, intensive uh, dissection opportunity. And I hope that uh, folks are interested and, and um, I'll put the link so that they can get more information about the courses. Okay. Thanks, Emily. All That's right. very generous. Of you. <laughs> I'm so happy to connect with your people. Yes. Yes. I'm well, excited to share it. I wish I could come, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll get the word out and, and hopefully hopefully some folks can get some good out of what you've got to offer. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, dear. Okay. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>